I want to start uh, with uh, sort of pointing toward a, a quote from uh, Sadia Hartman, uh, who teaches at Columbia University. Um, she's an relig- English uh, professor, cultural critic. In her book, Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route, she writes, I too live in the time of slavery, by which I mean I am living in the future created by it. It is the ongoing crisis of citizenship. In their path-breaking and influential study, Racial Formation in the United States, Michael Omi and Howard Winant <clears throat> define race as quote, a concept which signifies and symbolizes social conflicts and interests by referring to different types of human bodies. This is a compact theorem, if you will, on what race is. And it challenges the major ideas of race, either as an ideological construct or an objective condition. These two theorists contend that race is an element of social structure rather than an irregularity within it, a dimension of human representation rather than an illusion. That race is an element of our social structure, so it's something normal in our social structure. It's not an irregularity, it's not an anomaly. It's a dimension, it's a dimension of human representation. It's not an illusion. The position that they advocate then proposes to understand race as a social construct. They use the term, it's a sociological term, racial formation to denote the complex, historically situated process by which human bodies and social structures are represented and arranged, how race is linked to the way in which a society is organized and the way in which it is ruled. From this perspective, race is both a matter of social structure and cultural representation. There is an aesthetics to race. We see this in terms of geography and space, when we separate ourselves one from another. There is a cultural representation. There's an aesthetics to race. And some people start to disturb the aesthetics. This is our problem with housing and real estate. Someone disturbs the aesthetics in my community, which means that I go off to found another community. Racial formation process accounts for the cluster of problems regarding race, dilemmas of racial identity, and the relation of race to other forms of difference, including gender and nationality. The identity of homegrown black people, African Americans, the descendants of the enslaved people, is perhaps the most despised racial identity in the United States. It could be the most despised identity worldwide. We alienate other black people around the world from black people in the United States, and we reward them for alienating themselves from us. We encourage them to identify black people in the United States, homegrown Americans, as pathological, And black immigrants are quick to differentiate themselves from homegrown African-American people. They don't want to be like us, like them. And they want you to know it. Racial formation also clarifies the nature of racism and its relation to social oppression, even as we find this in so-called first world or developed nations. I use the theorist Iris Marion Young to differentiate social oppression in the United States in all liberal countries, whether you're in England, Great Britain, or you're in France, or you're in Germany, as economic exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, 
cultural imperialism, and systemic as well as random violence. If you think about the fires that were in London not uh, just a couple years ago, where mostly poor uh, immigrants and poor British citizens, subjects, really, I guess is their more technical denotation, these are marginalized people living in very poorly constructed housing that is in, what was incredibly flammable. No one seemed to really pay attention to that, but some companies walked away with lots of money because of it. Huh? So if we, clar we think of race as being clarified in relation to social oppression, this perspective helps us grasp the brutality of race on global and personal levels. It also discredits the romanticization of race as essence and its misrepresentation as illusion, as if there is something so romantic and beautiful and wonderful and mysterious about being black. Or as if race is just an illusion. Racial formation process maintains that race is not a deviation. I'm repeating this. It's not a deviation within a given social structure, but a constant feature embedded within it. To explain race as an ideological construct or the result of biased thinking is to render race an illusion. But our theorists, Omi and Wynant, argue very cogently that our societies are, quote, so thoroughly racialized that to be without racial identity is to be in danger of having no identity. To be raceless is akin to being genderless. Indeed, when one cannot identify another's race, a micro-sociological crisis of interpretation results. Who are you? I had a student many years ago in our Pulse program at Boston College. And this student had a Sri Lankan parent and a parent from Colombia. Beautiful young woman. And someone asked her, what are you? Hmm? What are you? We can't identify, and when we can't identify, we have a micro-sociological crisis. How should I relate to you? So if you're black and from the islands, I have an entirely different way of relating if you're black. And hmm. there's, a, there, there's a way in which we've made race the predominant factor. Certainly, in, it has a global resonance, but we've made it a predominant factor. We've made it really the structuring process here in the United States. When white immigrants arrive here, and when they've been doing it since the 19th century, the first thing we teach them is that they are no longer Polish or Italian or Irish. They're white. Even if we think, then, that race is not an ideology, racism certainly is. Because racial formation process gives critical attention to social structures and social signification, it can account for racism as ideology. If I say racism is the pro product of biased thinking, an ideology that willfully justifies, willfully justifies advances and maintains the systemic domination of certain race or races by another, Racism goes beyond prejudice, feeling, or opinion formed without concrete evidence or experience or knowledge. It goes beyond bigotry, doctrinaire, intolerance. It joins those feelings or attitudes to the putative exercise of legitimate power in a society. In this way, racism never relies on the choices or actions of a few individuals it is institutionalized. It's part of our social structure. We racialized subjects sustain and transmit racism as an ideology through our uncritical acceptance of standards, symbols, habits, assumptions, 
reactions and practices rooted in racial differentiation and racially assigned privilege. So black people don't play hockey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And white men can't jump. Mm To say that, there is no intent to blame, but to shake us from our drowsy uh, sort of acceptance of the world in which we live. Racism permeates the development and transmission of culture. You know this, including education and access to it. Literary and artistic expression. Various forms of communication, representation, and leisure. Black people don't swim. The participation and contribution to the common good. Racism affects all this. It affects opportunities to work, to engage in meaningful political and economic activity. It disrupts human flourishing, including intellectual, psychological, sexual, and spiritual growth. It interrupts religion, membership, and leadership catechesis and spirituality, ritual and doctrine, and theology. Racism permeates every sphere of social, interpersonal, structural relations. Too often we reduce racism to individual acts of malice or individual hatred committed by bad or rogue individuals. So consider... Uh, We'll go through some of those in just a minute. But when we do this, when we think of it's just those bad people, it's not me. When we do this, we obscure the larger and deeper dynamics of the ways in which race and racism form us as individuals, as a national community, as churches, as synagogues, as mosques. Racism never relies on the choices or actions of a few white individuals. To repeat, it's structured or institutionalized. It goes well beyond our individual prejudices. It ties those attitudes to feelings of superiority and to so-called legitimately and commonly sanctioned exercises of power. As an ideology, racism envelops the normal and ordinary social setup and it spawns a negatively charged context in which flesh and blood human beings live out their daily lives and struggle to constitute themselves as persons. Racism is no mere problem to be solved, but a way of life, a way that we define reality. And racial formation alerts us to the fact that racism is not something out there to solve or to fix. It's in our consciousness. It shapes our discourse, our practices. So consider the lives of black and Latinx women and men are at risk during even simple encounters with police officers. Indeed, dozens of our fellow citizens have died either directly or at the hands of police or under suspicious circumstances while in police custody or during police tactical responses. Such behavior must be condemned and denounced, just as random and often fatal attacks against police officers are equally heinous and must be denounced and condemned. Consider the rate of incarceration in the United States. Has anyone here seen the documentary 13th? It's a very important documentary to see. It's a very important documentary to see, very difficult to watch, but very important to grapple with. It deals really with the 13th Amendment. We cannot enslave people except for crime. Since 2008, the rate of incarceration in the United States has increased to the rate of 716 prisoners per 100,000 persons in the population. And although the United States, and you probably know this, represents roughly 5% of the world's population, it represents almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. 
The United States incarcerates black men at a rate higher than South Africa did during the time of apartheid. Consider that we continue to live with the mocking, overheated, vicious rhetoric that lingers from campaigns. We've even begun to normalize that rhetoric, continuing to polarize our interpersonal, familial, civic, even ecclesial relationships. Moreover, in the name of knee-jerk patriotism, some of us have deepened our divisions by taking it upon ourselves to physically, even fatally assault others whose views, dress, ethnicity, race, culture, or social standing differs from our own. Consider that we falsely accuse, malign, even defame as dangerous as threats, children, women, and men who are Muslims, who are immigrants, Jews, Sikhs, those who are incarcerated and economically impoverished. Recall the image of hundreds of young people, nearly all young white men, marching in the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, spewing anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant, racist rhetoric. The Jews will not replace us, they said. Recall that a young white man fatally shot nine black Christian women and men as they prayed and studied the Bible in a church in Charleston, South Carolina. Recall that after shouting ethnic slurs at two immigrant East Asian Indian men in a restaurant in Olath, Kansas, a white man killed one of them, wounded the other, and fatally shot the young white man who came to their defense. Recall that after verbally threatening two young women, both African-American, one in Muslim dress, who were riding a Portland, Oregon train, a white man fatally stabbed the three white men who intervened to protest their, his behavior. Consider that our fractured national discourse about immigration focuses on our southern border. In the past, immigrants from Ireland and Italy or Poland were scapegoated, but now, at least for the moment, no matter our identity, no matter our race or ethnocultural group, we all scapegoat Latinx women and men who seek to escape the violence of poverty, hunger, gangs, and corruption. Tomorrow, it will be other peoples with different skin tones, fleeing similar injustices, and once again, we will insist that they threaten us. Immigration reform, then, is not about fixing our southern border. It's about repairing our sense of how we are to receive those entering our midst. It's about repairing our sense of humanity. Consider that although the current rate of overall unemployment has begun to decrease, the rate of unemployment among people of color continues to rise in comparison to that of white people. Yet work is of fundamental importance to the fulfillment of the human person. Salary disparities in relation to gender and race also persist. Economists maintain that nationally, the gap in median annual pay for a woman and a man who hold a full-time, year-round job is such that <clears throat> overall, women in the United States are paid 80 cents for every dollar paid to men amounting to an annual gender wage gap of $10,470. The gap is even wider for women of color. We are a body of broken bones. We are a social body of broken bones. If our social order is so fractured and divided by structural racism, economic exploitation and cultural imperialism, by sexism and misogyny, by homophobia, transphobia, we reinforce ourselves as a body of broken bones. Do we recognize that some social groups suffer extensive and protracted injustices as a consequence of our many unconscious assumptions, our well-meaning ordinary interactions? Do we recognize 
in this country that our democratic electoral legislative and dissenting procedures disguise the ways in which oppression is structurally or systemically reproduced in all of our major economic, political, cultural, and religious institutions. Our body is a body of broken bones, and our body cries out for healing. Can we heal ourselves? And who will heal us? Our body of broken bones cries out for healing, and who will heal us? Mm -hmm.